Hello, and thanks for joining me. As much as I would love to introduce a video on the meaning of life with a presentation from Michael Palin, unfortunately, to do any justice to this great philosopher would require a longer clip than the fair use doctrine would allow. So instead, with deepest apologies, here's William Lane Craig. It, it seemed to me that on a naturalistic worldview, everything is ultimately destined to destruction and the heat death of the universe. As the universe expands, it grows colder and colder as its energy is used up. There will be no life, no heat, no light, only the corpses of dead stars and galaxies expanding into endless darkness. The universe is neither better nor worse for what we do. Um, that ultimately there isn't, uh, it, our moral lives become vacuous there's, because they don't have that kind of cosmic significance. This clip comes from a 2011 debate between Craig and Shelley Kagan, and I would encourage any Christian watching this who believes Craig has never lost a debate to never watch this debate, if you want to keep thinking that. Let me try to express the uh, argument here in formal terms, and in the process, steel man it as much as I can. One, if given a particular philosophical position, all things will have ended and been forgotten at the heat death of the universe, then under that position, nothing matters or has meaning or value. Two, under atheism, all things will have ended and been forgotten at the heat death of the universe. We'll take atheism here to mean strong or positive atheism, the affirmation that no gods exist. Three, therefore, under atheism, nothing matters or has meaning or value. This represents a kind of overarching, all-encompassing argument, or uber-argument, representing the views of Christians who say that under atheism, there is no meaning. In cases where a Christian makes a narrower claim, for example, that under atheism, nothing has any value without regard to whether it has meaning or matters, the uber-argument here can be correspondingly narrowed. Whatever the particulars of the Christian claim, when it's expressed formally like this, it becomes easy to spot the problem. There seems to be no way to support the first premise. The second premise might be supported by appealing to current scientific models of the universe, and by arguing somehow that without a deity there is nothing to preserve any information beyond the heat death of the universe. It is possible that there are non-theistic models for preserving information past the heat death, which almost certainly would refute materialism at the very least, but I won't pursue that here. But the first premise, stated explicitly like this, seems to be dead on arrival. How could it possibly follow from the fact that nothing is eternal, that nothing matters or has meaning or value? Apologists will sometimes say that there will be nothing to remember anything you did or were if theism isn't true. And that's why nothing has meaning or value if atheism is true. Because if there is nothing and no one at the heat death to remember what you were and what you did and thus preserve your meaning, then you don't really have meaning in the here and now. Again, we can see the problem with this by expressing it formally. 1. If there is any time t at which x has no meaning, then x has no meaning at time t equals 0. 2. There is a time, namely the time of the heat death of the universe, at which nothing will have meaning. 3. Therefore, nothing has meaning at time t equals 0, or the present moment. Again, no argument has ever been presented, or to my knowledge even attempted, for the first premise. In fact, as it is currently stated, it's flatly ridiculous. So let's go ahead and steel man it a little bit more, and say that if there is any time t is greater than zero, at which x has no meaning, then x has no meaning at time t equals zero. This is probably easier to defend. And yet, no defense of it has been presented. I can think of no defense that can be presented. Other times, apologists will say that only meaning which has been given by God or which has been affirmed or validated by God counts. Again, we state this formally. One, if X does not have a meaning that has been affirmed or validated by a deity, then X does not have a meaning. Two, under atheism, nothing has a meaning that has been affirmed or validated by a deity. Three, therefore, under atheism, nothing has a meaning. And again, it's easy to see that premise one is unsupported. At this point, they might try to pivot and say that only meanings which are divinely affirmed or validated are good meanings. And if they're not divinely validated, they're bad. The question then becomes, what does it mean for a meaning to be good or bad? And this will force the apologist to go back to one of the earlier definitions of what a meaning is, such as being eternal or being validated by a deity. 
But just as there's no reason to think that meaning must be eternal or divinely validated, there's no reason to think that good meaning must be eternal or divinely validated. Now, the apologist might try a weaker but more intuitive tactic by saying that while the atheist might have meaning, and while that meaning might be in some sense good, surely eternal or divinely validated meaning is preferable to meaning that is not eternal or divinely validated. So this is what the apologist is now arguing. 1. We should believe whichever worldview gives us the better meaning of life. 2. Christianity gives a better meaning of life than atheism. 3. Therefore, we should believe Christianity. There are a number of problems here. First, this is a prudential argument, an argument that we should believe something, in this case Christianity, because it is in our own best interest personally to do so. The most famous example of a prudential argument is, of course, Pascal's wager. A great many people, myself included, feel that it is inappropriate to use any kind of prudential argument when establishing whether or not we should believe that God exists, or anything for that matter. Second, I would reject the first premise. Even if Christianity being true would give a better meaning of life than atheism being true, it could be that atheism would still give a meaning of life that is perfectly sufficient and be superior to Christianity in every other respect, such as enjoying more evidential support for being true. Third, as we'll see later, there are serious problems with the notion that a meaningful life can in some sense come from God. We'll look at the reasons for that in a little while, but first, we have to turn to the subject of what it means for life to have meaning in the first place. Our source for much of what follows will be Atheism, Morality, and Meaning by Michael Martin, published by Prometheus Books in 2002. Martin, one of the most prolific and most rigorous atheist philosophers of the last half century, distinguished between two kinds of meaning, meaning as purpose, where the meaning of life is your purpose in life, and meaning as value, where the meaning of life is what value life has. We can say that life has value if and only if it is, on the whole, good for the person who leads it. This means, of course, that value meaning is relative to the person leading it. We can say that life has a meaning in the sense of purpose if that life has a purpose with positive significance, which provides psychological satisfaction, is possible to fulfill, and is neither arbitrary nor lacks a plausible explanation. The example Martin gives of an arbitrary purpose is to look beautiful via the extermination of all flying insects. If someone said that was their purpose and offered no further explanation, we'd be justified in thinking that this person's life was meaningless in the purpose sense. This, by the way, raises the possibility of one more objection of atheists having meaning to their life. A Christian might state that unless a purpose is divinely given or divinely validated, it is arbitrary. But this doesn't follow. Arbitrary would mean that no purpose is better than any other, and atheists can give plausible reasons why their purposes are better than other purposes that can be imagined. Perhaps not better in the sense that a divine entity approves of some purposes more than others, but once again, if Christians believe that this should be the sense that counts, they have to argue for it. And a successful argument for this proposition has never been made known to me. Martin also distinguishes between descriptive purpose and normative purpose. This isn't something I'm going to go into in detail because I'm not convinced that normative purpose is a thing, but here's the short version. Descriptive purpose is, for example, my purpose is to read as much as possible about the history of Rome. Normative purpose would be, my purpose should be to read as much as possible about the history of Rome. If I say that my purpose is to read about Rome, it doesn't follow that my purpose should be to read about Rome, and vice versa. What this means is, if a Christian says that the purpose of life is to glorify God, it doesn't necessarily follow that the purpose of life should be to glorify God. It's possible that a Christian's descriptive purpose is to glorify God, and their normative purpose, what they should be doing, is to maximize their use of reason. If a Christian claims that both their descriptive and normative purposes are to glorify God, then they would have to argue for each one separately. With all this in mind, we can now turn to the main question of this video, a question that apologists aren't made to confront nearly as often as they should be. What perceived problem with atheistic accounts of meaning can be solved by substituting it for a theistic account? To put it another way, if we don't have meaning without God, why would we have meaning with God? How does assuming that God exists solve anything? In general, there are three possibilities for basing a meaning of life around God, or at least around a spiritual realm of some sort. 
First, the divine calling view, under which the meaning of life is to fulfill the role in God's great plan for the universe which he has assigned to you. Second, the redemption view, under which the meaning of life is to redeem our sinful and unworthy selves in the eyes of God, and thereby glorify him. Third, the completion view, under which the meaning of life, or at least of this earthly life, is to prepare ourselves for the eternal afterlife which awaits us. With some stretch of the imagination, this last view is compatible with atheism. It only requires a spiritual or non-material realm of some sort. But for this video, we're only going to consider the theistic versions of the completion view. All these views define meaning in terms of God's purpose, which in the atheist view places the apologist in a bit of a pickle. If person P has decided that their meaning of life is such that it requires X to be true, and if it turns out that X is false, then we can reasonably say that P's life is absurd. Apologists have decided that their meaning of life in some sense requires God to exist. If it turns out that God does not exist, then the apologist's life is absurd. Apologists will of course call this a non-problem because God exists. But even if God exists, it would still have to be true that human meaning can be expressed in terms of God's purpose. And there's a problem with this, because God's other attributes seem to be incompatible with his having a purpose. For example, God is also supposed to be non-temporal, meaning he is outside of time or in a state of timelessness. But purposive activities, which take place at a certain time and have a certain duration, can for that reason only be done by temporal agents. So God can't have a purpose, which means the apologist's life is absurd. God is also supposed to be absolutely simple, but creating each human with a different purpose, or creating all humans to have one purpose and all animals to have another, implies a divine plan which is not absolutely simple, which in turn applies a planner who is not absolutely simple. So again, God can't have a purpose, which again means the apologist's life is absurd. There's a lot of overlap between these kinds of arguments and incompatible properties arguments for the non-existence of God, so I won't explore these further here, but instead turn to specific problems with each individual view. First, the divine calling view, under which our purpose is to fulfill the specific role that God has assigned to us in his divine plan. But how can a Christian know with certainty what their role is? If Jane and four other Christians are in a room together and all believe that they are communing with and being guided by the Holy Spirit, it is nonetheless possible for all five Christians to reach different contradictory views about what Jane's role is in the divine plan. And the failure of God to clearly communicate with us in the same sense that, for instance, I clearly communicate with my wife every day, means that we have no objective way to resolve this dispute. It does no good to turn to the Bible because, again, five Christians, each believing they are guided by the Holy Spirit, can and usually do reach five different conclusions about how the Bible should be interpreted as applying to a given question. So if the divine calling view is correct, the only way Jane can possibly fulfill the role that God has assigned to her is by accident, by being lucky enough to be correct about what her role is. This poses a serious problem given the criterion we mentioned earlier that a purpose should be fulfillable. Also, if fulfilling the role that God has assigned for us is for the purpose of furthering God's divine plan, then God's divine plan requires human cooperation. But it seems pretty clear that many humans, and in fact many Christians, do not cooperate. For example, it seems inconceivable that God would assign any of his followers the role of being grotesquely unkind to others. This means that if a person believes that his purpose is to fulfill his divine calling, and at the same time this person is grotesquely unkind to others, then objectively speaking, that person's life is absurd. I don't think any Christian would argue with this. And yet, there are grotesquely unkind Christians. Christians, in other words, who are not cooperating with the divine plan and thereby thwarting God. I know of no coherent explanation for how a perfect God can be thwarted. I know of no coherent explanation for why a God with perfect foreknowledge, who would know that this particular plan would be thwarted, would nonetheless institute it. It does no good to say that the grotesquely unkind Christian in refusing to cooperate with the divine plan is actually helping bring about an even greater and more inscrutable plan, the diviner plan perhaps, or even the divinest plan. 
But this makes no sense. For one thing, either a plan is the divine plan or it isn't. And for another, if someone is cooperating with God by being grotesquely unkind, then God himself would to some extent be grotesquely unkind, which is supposed to be impossible. And then, of course, there's the problem that, as we discussed earlier, a person's purpose must not be arbitrary or must have a plausible explanation in order for that person's life to have meaning in the purpose sense. And Christians can give no plausible, non-arbitrary reason why God wants us to fulfill our roles in the plan. For these reasons, and also inasmuch as a person's fulfillment must be able to provide some amount of psychological fulfillment, and inasmuch as it is possible to fulfill one's divine calling without being psychologically fulfilled at all, this theistic account of the meaning of life fails. Let's turn to the second view, the redemption view, under which the meaning of life is to allow God to express his goodness and his glory by redeeming us from our sin. Under this view, the meaning and purpose of life has nothing to do with human achievement and everything to do with God, who created the universe to glorify himself and created human beings who would inevitably sin and be in need of redemption again to glorify himself by redeeming them. Our purpose is simply to be redeemed by repenting. What's the point? God is supposed to be perfect. God is supposed to be not only infinitely glorious, but infinitely knowing of just how glorious he is. He is also, presumably, infinitely confident in these attributes, and not the least bit insecure about them. So why would he need to express his glory at all? What's the point? And what's the point in expressing his glory in this, it has to be admitted, really bizarre way? If a man fathered children and raised them in such a way that he knew they would choose to do horrible things and need to be redeemed, which he could have prevented from coming about, would we call him glorious? Or would we call him a bad father? If God wanted to express his glory, why not do it by creating humans who would simply love him and praise him for creating them? Why make it so that they would need to be redeemed? If you're a Christian and you're watching this, I'm sure you're already thinking of answers to these questions. But whether you can think of answers is not the point. Because remember Jane and her four friends. Christians, even Christians who have read the Bible and believe they are being guided by the Holy Spirit, cannot achieve consensus on the answers to these questions and there is no objective way to tell whose answers are right. This means that any answers you might come up with are arbitrary, and in order to give a life meaning, a purpose cannot be arbitrary. So the redemption view also fails. God's redeeming human beings cannot be the meaning of life. Finally, we have the completionist view. Under this view, justice demands that an afterlife is necessary for the completion of this earthly life so that those who have suffered at the hands of fate and so been unable to complete their goals, or who have had some really rotten goals in this life, such as spreading grotesque unkindness, and don't realize it in time, are able to achieve their full potential. Thus, the purpose of life, or rather, the purpose of life on earth, is to begin the great work that will find its culmination in the afterlife, whatever that culmination may be. But first of all, the notion that justice demands an afterlife is based on wishful thinking. We would need an independent reason to think that it's actually true, that the afterlife actually exists. Second, if the nature of the afterlife is either infinite reward or infinite punishment for the finite acts committed on earth, this is in neither case just. Third, some potentials cannot be remedied by supposing a heavenly afterlife. How can a general realize his full potential in heaven, for example, if there are no wars in heaven? Fourth, we once again have the problem of what one is supposed to do in order to prepare for the afterlife. Christians cannot reach consensus on this matter, and there is no objective way to decide between competing theories. Fifth, there seems no non-arbitrary reason why a dual state of existence, an earthly life followed by an eternal afterlife, would be necessary for God to achieve his aims. The two major theories about this, fulfilling our divinely assigned roles and glorifying God by allowing him to redeem us, have been addressed earlier. And finally, at best, this theory would give meaning to one stage of our lives, the earthly stage. It would not give meaning to our complete lives, which would be earthly life plus afterlife. And if one supposes that the afterlife is eternal, then our earthly life is proportionately infinitesimal. And the extent to which the redemption view can give our lives meaning is correspondingly infinitesimal. So there seems no satisfactory way under which an apologist can say that life has meaning if and only if God exists. 
With any luck, an apologist will find meaning in their own life, a meaning that does not collapse into absurdity by the falsehood of a required proposition. But if so, that meaning will apply whether or not God exists. And therein lies a problem, for I would argue that it is only when we are free from the specter of thought crime, which hovers over all apologetic endeavors, that we are free to find a meaning in our lives. If you enjoyed this video and want to help my channel grow, please hit the like, share, and subscribe buttons. And if you want to share the meaning of your life, leave a comment below. This was an amazing video to do, and I want to thank you for joining me for it. We'll see you in the next one. I'm David John Wellman, and the rest... Well, that's the end of the film. Now here's the meaning of life. Don't be a dick.